We've got 45 minutes now or so in which uh, Jimmy's going to uh, answer some of the questions that we, we've put to him. And uh, I'll hand you over to him. Mm, try to answer. I think try to right. answer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, a uh, first question. No head to the body in First Corinthians and Romans. Is this relevant to discussions on hierarchy in the church? Well, yes, I would say so, uh, because the image of the body, whether you think of Christ as the head uh, or, or not, is of a, a, a tremendous interdependence um, where everybody has a role to play. What member of the body doesn't have a function? So, uh, in the congregations that we are accustomed to, we should, I mean, and if we were filling, trying to fulfill Paul's model, image of the body, would be where we're all mutually interdependent, and if uh, any member is not functioning properly, then the whole is suffering. And Paul is, is quite clear in this, in his letter to the Corinthians, um, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, and so on. The image is pretty clear of a mutual interdependence, a mutual respect, uh, which is, is the, the character of the body, in order for a group of people like this to function as the body of Christ in Salisbury or whatever, then uh, that is that mutual interdependence and mutual respect is very, very important. And uh, I'm not sure that many of our churches today actually live out the reality of the body of Christ. To that extent, uh, the body of Christ is not as well represented in many places as it should be. Is that enough on that? Thank you. <laughs> Just had a uh, Ooh, one in via live stream. Oh, please tell us a bit more about the culture and context of the people in Colossae. Uh. <laughs> um, uh, we, we don't know because if you read the first, first page of the thing, uh, I said more or less all I know about, <laughs> <laughs> about Colossae. Uh, we don't even if, if Paul ever visited it. Uh, so we haven't got a, a first-hand description of it. Uh, all we know about Colossae, Col Colossae uh, is the uh, Christians in Colossae to whom Paul writes uh, and says. So I, I don't really know it, uh, the answer to that, a bit more about the culture and context, except that they're in Asia Minor, uh, in roughly in the middle of Asia Minor. Uh, it's interesting that in the 12 letters... Uh, in uh, Revelation, remember, uh, Colossae is not mentioned because Colossae was probably destroyed by that earthquake which took place just after, not long after Paul's letter. Uh, and so uh, maybe Colossae was so destroyed, the church was so uh, destroyed that uh, the Christians in what was Colossae before moved elsewhere. So <laughs> there's not much more we can say about it. So, but all that I can say about Colossae is in that first page of the, of the, the booklet. So uh, if you want to follow it up, uh, read that again. <laughs> well, next one up. We, what might we understand by the phrase mature, perfect in Christ? Ah, yeah, ah, hmm. Mature, perfect in Christ. Uh, it's good that it's mature slash perfect because perfect in Christ means makes us think, uh-oh, uh-oh, I don't think we are going to get to perfection, are we? Uh, but mature is a good, a better image, a, an image more easy 
me to appreciate. Uh, it's the image of growth and becoming uh, adult, uh, responsible in think excuse me, thinking and relationships and so on. And uh, that's, that's the image. Oh, excuse me. The image he's using of child growing up into maturity. Now, any image of maturity in adulthood that we have uh, is, is uh, probably good and, and is sufficient for us to get a clear idea of what it means to be mature in Christ. Responsible, having responsibilities to uh, various people, um, to have obligations, to have concerns, cares, and so on. That's maturity, accepting that we have a responsible role to play in the community, in our family, in society, and trying to live up to that sense of responsibility. Uh, so, so that's, I mean, mature in Christ is, the in Christ is important, um, because it's an interesting question. To what extent is all our life in Christ? Uh, do we use that phrase only when we gather together to worship? That's us in Christ. Or do we use it in family context, in social context, business context? In what degree and how do we live out that sense of belonging to Christ and responsibility to Christ and on behalf of Christ to others? These are questions which we should be asking regularly because they're the kind of checklist that we should go through every so often, not just at New Year when we make new, new, new resolutions. Is that enough for the moment? I'm not sure I'm answering these all very well, but can you <laughs> roll down the next one? Elemental forces that shape society. Can you say more about that and how would you, how you understand them to be subject to Christ? <sighs> could I say more about it? I could say no. <laughs> but uh, that would be a bit unfair. Elemental forces that shape society. It's, it's uh, I mean, think of what are the elemental forces which shape our society. Um, uh, you see it in television, news media, um, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, these forces which do shape us, whether we realize it or not. Uh, the, 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 the news channels that we look at and, and prefer, the newspapers that we read and those that we don't, but don't really approve of, and so on. These are all forces uh, shaping society in which we are. So how do we, how do we respond to them? Do we um, contribute to uh, correspondence, say, with our favoured newspaper and uh, try to, to uh, push um, the sense of responsibility for various aspects of, of, of social life as, as much as we can? Or how do we how do we react to them. Um, the point about them being subject to Christ is that uh, for Christians there is uh, a power, a sense of power, which is higher, more powerful than the forces, the other forces that shape society. Uh, and, and the question therefore is how do we, um, how do we let Christ shape our lives uh, to be responsible within society and uh, it's it's the, the the power of christ shaping individual lives individual christian lives those who have submitted to him and, and are led by him who are become are the force for good in society and we should be willing to accept that responsibility uh, because there are other forces outside which uh, otherwise will shape society is there any supplementary to that? No? Oh, right. He's either speaking a load of rubbish or is very profound. Aha. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I, it's one of my, well, it's a subject I'm, I'm very happy to speak about because Paul's attitude to, to women has been deeply misunderstood, I think, to a great extent. Uh, in a social context, um, where, as we saw in the uh, advice to households, uh, fathers totally responsible and wives being submissive and so on, a, that catches the uh, human and social relationships of the time. Whether we like it or not, women's uh, role and status was inferior to males. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised about that, for goodness sake. It's only 100 years since women had the vote in our own society, and we are a mature uh, society, etc. So uh, it, it's something we find difficult to recognize, but and if we're going to understand a lot that's said in Scripture about women and the relations of men and women, we've got to understand that, that the role status of women was below uh, the level of, 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 man, of men. So uh, it's interesting that Paul seems ready on the one part to accept that this is, this is how society is. And so um, he, he discourages women from uh, kicking over the traces, you know, in, in when he's giving advice in 1 Corinthians uh, 14 to the worship. Um, he's... he's uh, very keen to say, now, if you've got a, a question to ask, we we'll ask it, but if, or if you're speaking in tongues or something, uh, but somebody else doesn't speak in the, the known language afterwards and translate the speaking in tongues or whatever, then no more, no more. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, concern is, is, is very, very strong. Um, so the role of women is, is, is quite restricted in many ways within society, and Paul, um, again and again, does not kick over that. He doesn't want the church in Corinth or whatever to be regarded as totally liberal and running over the, uh, going over the, the, the traces. On the other hand, Paul had more women associates and co-workers than we generally allow. Uh, you realize when you do a, a, a word, a, a person count in all these uh, say hi to Fred and hello to Joe and so on, at the end of his letters, 20% um, of his closest associates, including his co-workers, were women. Very interesting. And some of the women uh, were very prominent. Um, if you look at uh, Romans 16, for example, the uh, Roman 16 is, is sent as a, a, a commendation of Phoebe, who's a, a deaconess. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not a deaconess. She's a deacon, excuse me, um, and so on. And she's got a, an important work to do in Rome. And so he writes to Rome to tell her about, uh, to, to commend her to it. But there's Prisca and Aquila. Prisca and Aquila. Prisca? Priscilla? It's Priscilla and Aquila. It's not him and her, Mr. and Mrs. It's her, Prisca, Aquila. Hmm, very interesting. Um, he's very comment commendatory about there. And uh, Mary, who worked very hard among you, and Andronicus and Junia, who were eminent among the apostles. Isn't that wonderful? Junia. Uh, and if you look at the old translations, you'll find it's Junias, right? Junias, Andronica, Andronicus, Junias. It couldn't be that it was a woman. How could a woman be an apostle, a significant apostle before Paul? Oh, no, no, no. It's Andronicus and Junias. But it's been since discovered, realized, that there was no, the name Junias did not function in the ancient world. There were no Juniases. There were only Junias, Junia. So it's bound to be a female, a woman, and she is eminent among the apostles. So that's, that, that list of greetings at the end of Romans 16 is a good 
um, example of the status of women in Paul's eyes and in Paul's churches and how, what he commends to his churches. So I've got no uh, qualms in uh, commending Paul's uh, attitude to women and the role of women in the church. Okay. Any? Gosh, they're very submissive. Oh, is it? Oh, uh, this one. Oh, gosh, yes. Um, ah. How do we avoid implying Christ's sufferings Suffering is lacking in, lacking or incomplete in some way. How do we avoid implying? Not sure I fully understand the question, but I'll try. Uh, th anyone to elaborate? <laughs> Uh, yeah, just so, because it talks about Paul filling up within himself uh, ah. those that are lacking, and it ah. implies in some way uh, Christ's sacrifice yes. or his sufferings must therefore be incomplete. Uh, yes. That doesn't seem right. So how do we avoid that implication while working through the, the verse? Right, right. Yes. Well, it's, it's uh, two aspects to it. One is uh, the, in, the whole in Christ understanding of Paul, that Paul understands his and his community's life bound up in Christ, uh, tied together with him. So there is a sharing in his life, in his sufferings. Uh, and, and the other aspect is that Paul's understanding of salvation, redemption, is a process. It's not that uh, when you come to believe or are baptized or whatever, you are saved. And you can put it as a past tense, complete and done. Uh, Paul would never say that. Paul would talk about being saved. You are in process of being saved. And so in that process, you are sharing in uh, Christ's life because uh, the process of being saved is sharing in Christ's sufferings uh, and ending in his resurrection. So it's that, it's that sense of, of a... Uh, this, this life as a, uh, an ongoing progression from the beginning, uh, when first faith or baptism, uh, through to the end to uh, salvation in, in resurrection. Uh, and in the process, it's a process of suffering, uh, the weakness, human weakness and, and frailty and so on. Uh, and that to be understood as sharing in the sufferings of Christ because you, are, uh, you have identified your life with Christ, and so uh, you go through that process of suffering and death to resurrection. I think something, something along these lines is probably what he means. So, is all suffering, however caused, part of the redemptive suffering with Christ, or is it only the suffering that is caused by persecution to to obedience to Christ that is relevant here? Um, well, that's, that's uh, an interesting question um, because do we think of Christians as a kind of group which are quite separate from the rest of society? Or do we think of Christians now as the first fruits of a much greater process uh, which will end in salvation of, for all. Um, and Paul wrestles with this, if you remember, in, in Romans chapter 9 to 11, uh, where he tries to take, make sense of the fact that people do object and reject, reject the gospel when it comes to them. And uh, so he hopes that in the end, all will be saved. That's his vision and hope. That's why he's going to the Gentiles, because he's seeking to bring them in uh, uh, with the hope, the full hope, that uh, his fellow Jews will recognize uh, Jesus to be Messiah and come on board as well. And so he does try to embrace the whole of reality in, in that hope. Um, uh, and, and so you can see um, the, suffering <coughs> the suffering aspect of, of humankind, of, of human society, 
as part of this, in the end, redemptive process. Um, and that, that's, that is hard to see. Uh, I, I, I freely confess that sometimes we see in some of the things that are happening in the Middle East and so on, uh, which look catastrophic, and we ask, hello, where is the redemption in this? Where is the hope in this? And that's hard to answer. That's, that's why, uh, for more than a century, um, Christian missionaries were keen to get the gospel uh, everywhere so that uh, whatever happened in social and suffering and so forth, there would be the hope of salvation held out that people could embrace and cling to and so on. Um, so I'm not quite sure, am I answering that question enough? Or is that a sufficient answer to the question? Have I persuaded you? <laughs> any more? Are there any questions from the floor? From now? If there are no questions, then I will feel I have failed. <laughs> because what I have said, I hope, should provoke you <laughs> to some degree at least, and the provocation should show itself in questions that you ask. Well then, if that follows, what about? <laughs> it might be that we need a little bit of it to settle before we can, right. we can see some of the questions. <laughs> right. Well, seriously, if you have questions which arise afterwards, uh, don't hesitate to write to me and see if I can come up with anything. I do get quite a lot of questions through emails and so forth, and uh, sometimes manage to answer them. <laughs> so I wouldn't promise to uh, either be very prompt or very complete, uh, but I would do my, do my best. That's a very kind offer. Um, can I say if people want to get hold of you that I can give them yes. your email address? Yes. Is that, is that yes, all right? Yes, that's fair enough. Yep. So yep. get hold of me and I will uh, <laughs> pass Jimmy's email address on to you. Jimmy, we want to say a really big thank you to, to you for being here today, for being willing to come and lead us and share what you've done. I suppose I should be saying thank you also for all the work that you, you put into the magazine. Yeah, um, yeah. As impressive as you say it looks, it would be nothing without the content mm. and a and a very big thank you to, to you for that yeah. as well. Yeah. Thank you.